Okay, so we are, this is material that's pretty much chapter 21 in the book. Um, it's about community ecology. What's a community? Bunch of populations all living in one place, in one ecosystem. So if we look at a, there we go, communities, all the populations that live and interact in a specific place, a biological community around here could include populations of things like coyotes and cottontails and bluebirds and earthworms and ground beetles and tiger beetles and tapeworms and tent caterpillars and pawpaws, orchard grass, white clover, wild violets, E. coli, wild cherry. We could go on and on and on. Dandelions, garter snakes, toads, um, you name it. If it's a species we find around here, you know, species or populations of raccoons, populations of possums, you know, and it's all these populations interacting together. Um, and there are many more populations here that we haven't named. Like I said, raccoons, possums, toads, frogs, um, all the trees. I don't think I have, I have one tree species on there. You know, there would be many more tree species than that. What we're going to do in this chapter, and this is where we get into our essential understandings, so this is kind of like your learning goals for the chapter. Um, the big picture is that all the things in the world are connected. Like when I say essential understanding, this is the thing that when you're 40 years old, whether you remember a single thing we ever talked about in biology or not, I want you to understand this, that everything in the world is connected, sometimes in ways we could not even begin to imagine. Who would think that little tiny white threads in forest soil would enable giant trees to grow? I wouldn't guess that. So that's the big thing that I want you to take away from this, is this level of connection. Um, you know, who would think that these little tiny microscopic organisms in your gut allow you to grow? Maybe nobody. So by the end of the unit, um, and this first one is one we're going to do in this chapter and the next, you're going to look at how matter and energy move through an ecosystem and different levels of organization, um, how matter and energy move between living things and back out into the environment. Um, we're going to look at how energy gets stored and lost. And the big thing for this chapter, so these two will we'll start in this chapter and we'll pick up in the next chapter. The big one, though, is we're going to look at how living things interact with their environment. We're going to look at predation, we're going to look at symbiosis, mutualistic and commensal relationships, and we're going to look a lot at competition here, okay? So moving on, let's go right for the blood. Blood and guts and gore. What a way to start the morning. Okay. You all know what predation is. You all know what predators are. Um, for your species that you've selected for your research, all of your species, frankly, are either predators or prey. Because in the natural world, if you're not one, you're the other. Sometimes you're both. So, for instance, garter snakes. Predator or prey? Both. Both. Yeah. They prey on toads. They will eat fish if given the opportunity. It's weird to watch, but they'll do it. Um, they will eat um, lots of bugs. But hawks will kill snakes. It's, very, it's not uncommon to see a hawk with a snake dangling from its talons. Um, so a lot of species are both predator and prey. In predation, one species captures, kills, and consumes the other. You already know that. Um, when there are a lot of prey, prey individuals, like when there are a lot of rabbits, more coyotes survive. Once you have more coyotes, guess what happens to the rabbit population? It shrinks. So if you remember the graph that we looked at in the last chapter, We looked at, that was lynx and snowshoe hare. And the lynx population 
while the rabbit population would spike. And then the following year, the lynx population would spike. And then once the lynx population spiked, the rabbit population would start to drop. And the rabbit population would drop. Well, then the lynx population would drop. Well, once the lynx population dropped, what did the rabbit population do? Woo! So population size for predators and prey species is very much tied together. And predation is a really effective regulator of population size. Um, why do we have so darn many deer in the state of Ohio? Yeah, why? Um, we wiped out all the natural predators of deer. Remember we said prior to 1803 there were wolves and mountain lions roaming these woods? Can you imagine walking out your back door and meeting a mountain lion? That was reality if you were an early Ohio settler. You lived in this part of the country in 1800, you might very well meet a mountain lion out your back door. You might very well have wolves trying to get your cattle at night. You wanted a stout log barn. We wiped out every carnivore except ourselves. We killed them all. Well, then what happens to the deer population? Well, of course, then we overhunted the deer, and the deer were actually extirpated from Ohio. But, um, you know, as, as people who hunt become fewer and hunting numbers are dropping somewhat nationwide, deer populations kind of exploded. And so we now have a lot of deer, and Division of Wildlife kind of keeps them in check. You know, they, they decide on bag limits. What was the bag limit in Columbia County for deer this year? Total? Is it six? A lot of years at six, because you can get, like, so many antlerless and so many, you know, during youth season. That's, that's a nice haul. If you get all six of your deer, that's a pretty good haul. We are at this point the predator that's keeping deer in check. So predation helps regulate population size. Okay. There's our mountain lion. Rawr! Yes, ma'am. It's been brought to my attention that I skipped a slide. We started right into predation. Let me put that on here. Yeah, symbiotic relationships where we just listed them all. That one. Okay, where we said there are five major types, and we started off talking about predation. How appropriate that we would circle that in red. Nature, bloody and tooth and claw. So predation, parasitism, competition, mutualism, and commensalism. Close relationships between different species that have evolved over many generations. And these are the five major types we're going to talk about. Sorry, we had to circle back and pick up that slide. Okay. So predation, the first one we're talking about, and like I said, you all know what it is. Okay, <clears throat> so predation. It's one of the ones that's most fun to talk about. Everybody wants to talk about predation. It's cool, it's bloody, it's amazing. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it because <laughs> you pretty much know this. But what you may not, you probably know at some level, predation drives evolution. So, guess who gets to pass on their genes? The best predator. The best predator gets the most calories, and getting the most calories means you survive, and it means your offspring survive. Lousy predators don't pass on their genes. A coyote that can't catch a mouse will not survive, let alone have babies and be able to feed them. Um, a wolf that can't take down, that can't work as part of a pack and take down 
um, an elk will not survive. So natural selection favors effective predators. Okay. If you're easy to catch, if you're easy to see, that also means you tend to die and you don't survive and you don't pass on your genes. So natural selection also favors prey that's hard to catch, prey that has good defense mechanisms. We're going to talk about a few of those defense mechanisms. Can anybody see the prey species in this picture? You can. You have good eyes. It is. It's this guy. It's a tomato hornworm. They are horrendous predators of tomato plants. Um, they can chew all the leaves off a tomato plant in about an hour. And they are almost exactly the same color as tomato stems. <laughs> They're really hard to see. Um, the first thing that the, the first way that you know that you have tomato hornworms in your garden is usually you go out and one of your plants has no leaves on it. Wah! And there will be lots of little frass, which are it's caterpillar poop um, under that plant. And you can stand there and stare and stare and stare and stare, and they're really hard to see, which makes them hard to catch and kill, which makes them very effective. Well, they're actually a predator, um, but it makes them a tougher prey species because birds will pick caterpillars off of plants. Having some birds in your garden is great because they'll prey on the caterpillars on your plants if they can see them. Tomato hornworms line up right along the stems and they hold real still. And they look like another tomato stem. Pardon? Very slowly. All they have to move is their little mouth part. And they slither down another, you know, centimeter and then they keep chewing. Um, they're amazing. So what we very often talk about is what's selected for. This is some of the terminology we tend to use. Selected for things that natural selection favors versus selected against. <gasps> Undo. Nope. Copy. Paste. Okay, selected for versus selected against. Selected for are things that natural, natural selection favors. Selected against are things that don't work out so well, like being a really slow mountain lion. Um, being a really slow rabbit would also be selected against. The fastest and the strongest tend to survive. Survival, survival of the fittest. We'll talk real briefly about a few of the defense mechanisms that prey species use. Um, if you look tougher than you are, that's a good thing. Um, and I see this in um, high school students all the time. People try to look a little bit tougher than they actually are. So mimicry. Yes, sir. But yeah, looking more dangerous than you are is really good. Looking like you are bad. Mimicry is what it's called when you intentionally try to look like something that's dangerous or that tastes really bad. Um, you drew a picture of this. So in your images, and see, this is why you got to color the slides. This is why you lost points if you didn't color. Um, these are coral snakes and king snakes. It's a very small picture, I realize. One is deadly poisonous. One is totally safe. You could wear it around your neck as an accessory every day of the year and not be in any danger. They have the same exact colors. They're arranged differently. But um, that's mimicry. This is a monarch butterfly. How many of you have ever eaten a butterfly? <laughs> that was exactly the response I was looking for. Yeah, ew. Um, but birds eat butterflies. 
And monarchs, I'm told, taste bitter. They eat milkweed um, throughout their entire life, and that makes them taste bitter. So monarchs taste bad. Viceroys are delicious. Like I said, I've never eaten a butterfly either. Ew. But viceroys look enough like monarchs that birds will leave them alone. That's mimicry. And I'm so glad somebody has camo on today. This is perfect. Um, the, other, the other thing that prey animals tend to do as a defense mechanism is blend in. If you blend into your environment, you're harder to see and you're harder to, to eat. Can you see the insect in this picture? It's called a stick bug or a stick insect, walking stick. And they look just like a stick on a tree. Um, little eastern cottontail rabbits are darn near the same color as dried brush in the fall. Um, snowshoe hares in the winter are bright white. A deer in a field of brown grass. Those are all examples of camouflage. So the two vocabulary words here are mimicry and camouflage. And you should be updating your vocab sheet. Okay, tomorrow, well, this is the, this is the last idea we're going to look at. Because we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on predators. Herbivores are predators too. We've talked about this idea before. A rabbit is a vicious predator. If you're a clover plant... If you're a dandelion, that groundhog makes things tremble in fear. Okay, I will see you tomorrow. You will have a recall quiz on predator-prey relationships. And we'll start talking a little bit about the next thing.